All right, everyone, welcome to the second half of Sonny's Super Happy Fun Anatomy Hour. Yay! Uh, so now we are getting into the visceral portion of uh, the lectures. So um, as such, we are starting over with the lecture sequences. We are now back at 1-1 in the visceral portion, uh, which is cranial nerves. The cranial nerves uh, are a, a collection of 12 different nerves that stem from the brainstem, that branch out of uh, the brainstem or portions of the brain itself, as you can see in this first image. So all of these cranial nerves, all 12 of them, uh, use the same blueprint, are analogous to spinal nerves that we've already learned about. So we've already learned about sensory components of spinal nerves where we have the dorsal root ganglion. Uh, the dorsal root ganglion is the location of the cell bodies for the sensory components of spinal nerves. The, uh, the sensory components of spinal nerves have a peripheral process that projects out and arborizes in the uh, skin or the sensory area. They also have a central process that projects centrally uh, into the spinal cord uh, where it synapses on a sensory nucleus uh, like substantia gelatinosa or nucleus proprius. Uh, then that sensory nucleus, so, so that the ganglion neuron is between those two processes, is between those two synapses, between the central uh, synapse with the sensory nucleus and between its arborization point. So that is one neuron. The second neuron in that chain is the sensory nucleus and its ascending or afferent process that heads up to a uh, central uh, nucleus like uh, nucleus gracilis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> We've also learned about the motor components of spinal nerves, uh, where we have a lower motor neuron uh, that's receiving innervation from an upper motor neuron. And that lower motor neuron has a process that extends out peripherally to a skeletal muscle. Now, we haven't talked much about the autonomic nuclei and the autonomic nerves, but uh, all of these spinal nerves also have an autonomic component. We have talked about the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, IML, the intermedial lateral cell column in the thoracic region of the spinal cord and that that is the location for the cell bodies of the sympathetic systems. So taking that system as a blueprint, we see that <clears throat> those neurons are receiving some sort of uh, innervation from higher up in the central nervous system and those nuclei uh, within the IML send out a preganglionic process a preganglionic uh, uh, axon that's heading through the anterior root to synapse on the sympathetic chain ganglia or a visceral ganglion. Here in this image, we can see the sympathetic chain uh, located along the vertebral bodies. <clears throat> From there, though that preganglionic process synapses on the visceral ganglion. And that's the start of another cell in this neuron chain. So that visceral ganglion then sends out its own process, its post-ganglionic process, to whatever visceral organ it's going to innervate. <clears throat> so all of the spinal, um, all of the cranial nuclei or cranial nerves follow similar patterns. It's just a matter of where those key features are located. So all these cranial nerves, except for one and two, uh, come out of a portion of the brainstem, either the midbrain pons or the uh, medulla. Uh, as such, there is a lower motor neuron, uh, which is a motor nucleus, a cranial nerve motor nucleus, that sends out a peripheral process that ends up synapsing on and innervating a skeletal muscle. <clears throat> We also have sensory components of cranial nerves. Uh, those sensory components have a ganglion. That ganglion is not the dorsal root ganglion. 
but it's analogous to the dorsal root ganglion. These ganglia will be located throughout the head and neck region. Those ganglia of the cranial nerves have a peripheral component that goes out to arborize wherever, and a central component that heads uh, centrally and synapses on the first nucleus in the uh, sensory chain, analogous to the sensory nucleus in the spinal cord. <clears throat> we also have analogous uh, autonomic uh, uh, processes, autonomic chains. These are all parasympathetic. The cranial nerves uh, give off parasympathetic fibers. So there is a parasympathetic nucleus in the brainstem that sends out a preganglionic fiber synapsing on a uh, efferent ganglion. And that efferent ganglion of the parasympathetics has a postganglionic process that ends up synapsing on whatever smooth muscle or uh, organ component uh, that it ends up uh, uh, modulating and modifying. So throughout this lecture, think about uh, how the analogy holds between spinal nerves and uh, cranial nerves. The analogy breaks down in some places and we need to understand why that happens, but generally the concepts are the same and you can use that base that we've developed with the, crani with the spinal nerves to build on uh, in terms of the cranial nerves. So uh, also we haven't talked much about the different modalities or components of nerves. I mentioned in the histology uh, lecture, the neurohistology lecture, that the peripheral nerves contain a bundle of different types of nerves with different amounts of myelination that transfer information at different velocities down their axon. And so all of those different fibers, we've named them and talked about what component they're part of, uh, but uh, we name these neural fibers using these different acronyms. So so far, with regard to spinal nerves, we've already talked about uh, motor uh, nerve components. Those are called GSE, general somatic efferents. We've also talked about general somatic afferents. Those are the sensory uh, components of nerves. Now we've added on, specified in more detail, the autonomic component of these nerves. And those components are the general visceral efferents. There are also general visceral afferents uh, that send information back up in the same model as uh, somatic afferents. But now with cranial nerves, we have a couple extra modalities that we need to add on to. So we need to make these uh, distinguishing uh, uh, features clear and understand why they're named this way. The skeletal muscles of the head and um, many of the neck have a unique embryological origin. They're actually derived from neural crest cells, not from the, uh, the somites, not from the axial mesoderm. Because they have a different special embryological origin, uh, they have special uh, elements to them, and so we name them special visceral efferents. So the uh, general uh, somatic efferents and the special visceral efferents both go and synapse and innervate skeletal muscle. But those skeletal muscles in the head and neck are uh, specifically and specially derived from neural crest cells. <clears throat> now moving down, uh, we have in the head and neck region uh, specialized sensory uh, fibers. Two types. We have, uh, we have taste buds and olfaction uh, sense, uh, sensation. Those are called gustatory sensory receptors. Those gustatory sensory nerve fibers are called SVAs, special visceral afferents. We also have the special sense of, um, of hearing and sight. So those optic and auditory and vestibular uh, senses uh, are all called special sensory afferents because they're quite unique, uh, very different from 
other afferent uh, uh, sensory modalities. So for that reason, we give them different names, and they're only located from specialized st structures uh, that are embryologically derived from the central nervous system itself. So here's the naming uh, conventions on how these names are formed. So if it's general, it's derived from a somite. If it's special, it's derived from the head and neck, from the highly specialized pharyngeal structures embryologically. If the second word is somatic, it's talking about the peripheral body. If it's visceral, it's talking about the visceral body. Too easy. And then afferent and efferent uh, are talking about whether it's uh, an input, a sensory component, or an uh, output, an efferent motor component. And so these autonomics, <coughs> the, they're, do, they're termed visceral efferents because they are outputting um, a type of motor output, but to a visceral organ, such as a smooth muscle or some sort of glandular uh, tissue. So that's the naming convention. So now let's get into all of these uh, cranial nerves and we'll talk about them in detail. So the cranial nerves uh, can be organized and categorized in a number of different ways. The way that I think makes most sense uh, in lecturing is talking about uh, breaking these cranial nerves up by their components. Uh, so there are purely sensory cranial nerves. So these cranial nerves have only afferent components within their nerve fibers. There are also purely motor nerves, and these uh, nerves have only efferent components to them, only, uh, uh, only the motor components. And then there are mixed cranial nerves. So the mixed cranial nerves have sensory and motor. They've got visceral, and they've got um, uh, specialized or somatic uh, structures to them. So that's the categorization I'll, I'll, I'll use in the lecture, but there are many different ways to think about these, and I encourage you to find different ways and to test yourself on different ways so that you have a really strong foundation in this information. Because these cranial nerves are gonna form the basis of a lot of diagnostic thinking in the clinical setting, and uh, they are going to be nerves that we follow for the rest of the semester. So these nerves are critical. So first, let's talk about the purely sensory uh, cranial nerves. These are cranial nerves one, two, and uh, eight. So when we talk about cranial nerves and we number them, the convention for writing the nerves is to use Roman numerals. Uh, so this is a long-standing uh, convention in anatomy and in the clinical sciences. Uh, so, for instance, if you uh, decide that you're talking about cranial nerve 11 and you write two ones, then somebody's probably going to mistake you for, think for saying cranial nerve 2. Uh, so th just be aware of that naming convention and follow it. Uh, so here, the olfactory bulb is the first cranial nerve, and it contains gustatory uh, senses, chemical uh, uh, olfaction, uh, uh, smell, the, the sense of smell is located in the olfactory bulb. That's responsible for that. Optic nerve is the visual sense, so it has that those SSA fibers to it. The uh, vestibular cochlear nerve, part of your hearing and balance apparatuses, those are uh, SSA uh, so that's auditory and vestibular, balance and hearing. So uh, now we're going to belabor these quite a bit. We're going to follow each one of these nerves as it travels uh, through the skull. And that's the important part about this cranial nerve lecture. You need to be able to understand the pathway and the functionality of all of these cranial nerves. And to do that, you need to understand the osteology, you need to understand where they originate, their nuclei, where the ganglia are located, uh, and how that pathway evolves. Because as you're, as you're encountering patients and diagnosing them, understanding these bottlenecks in these nerves 
and the places where nerves come together uh, or diverge is going to give you the ability to diagnose issues with these cranial nerves that affect the entire uh, visceral portions of the head, neck, and body. And so this information is very important because it allows you to predict, for instance, the location of a tumor or the location of a nerve lesion uh, or um, any other number of uh, possible uh, sources of damage that can result in a specific loss of one or more functionalities. Uh, so uh, to start off with olfactory nerve, uh, so the olfactory nerve, a lot of uh, anatom so anatomists have fun sitting around uh, a, a table drinking wine and arguing about what's a cranial nerve and what's not a cranial nerve. That's how we spend our spare time at conferences around the world. So a lot of uh, anatomists would say that the olfactory nerve is not a cranial nerve. So it's ironic that I'm giving it to you first. The olfactory nerve is a projection uh, from the central nervous system. It is a collection of different neurons uh, that form a kind of nucleus uh, called the olfactory bulb. So here you can see an enlarged view of this olfactory bulb. The peripheral processes coming out of that olfactory bulb uh, travel through the, uh, uh, the cribriform plate into the olfactory mucosa. Uh, so olfactory tract is the central process, part of that central process. So actually, if we want to follow the analogy as closely as possible as the, uh, as the spinal nerves, then what we would say is that the olfactory neurons uh, are the, uh, the sensory receptor. They have a central process that travels through the cribriform plate to synapse on uh, the olfactory bulb, which is the nucleus. And then that nucleus has a central process that travels into the central nervous system. So the olfactory bulb is interesting because it actually synapses not on a sensory component, not on a portion of the primary sensory cortex, but it actually synapses in the amygdala <clears throat> and in the uh, hippocampus. So it has a direct uh, impact on our emotional state. <clears throat> so uh, at any rate, the peripheral processes of those uh, sensory neurons are there detecting chemical compounds uh, that interact with the nasal mucosa. So everything you smell is actually a, chem a, a molecule of that chemical wafting into the air and landing on your olfactory mucosa. <clears throat> so now let's talk about cranial nerve two. <clears throat> this is a, uh, another SSA nerve, and it's another one of these cranial nerves that anatomists argue about. Developmentally, the olfactory nerve is actually a projection from the central nervous system, from the uh, prosencephalon. The eye, the retina of the eye, is actually a, a layer of the central nervous system that develops outside the skull. <clears throat> so if we look at this process, uh, then we can say that the rods and cones are the sensory receptors, uh, they synapse on bipolar cells. Bipolar cells have a uh, end up uh, converging on uh, ganglion cells. Those ganglion cells have a, a peripheral process that heads toward the bipolar cells to receive that information, and they have a central process that heads along the uh, inner portion of the retina and ends up forming the optic nerves, the optic chiasm, and the optic tracts. Those neurons end up synapsing on the lateral geniculate nucleus, or the LGN. So when we look at this process, we can see light actually has to travel through the ganglion cells, through the bipolar cells, in order to interact with the rods and cones. So the first Layer. So as light is coming into the eye 
it travels through the lens and impacts uh, the, the retina by first traveling through the ganglion cells, traveling through the bipolar cells, before stimulating the sensory neurons, which are the, or sensory receptors, which are the rods and cones. <clears throat> So after we get out of the eye, uh, the optic nerve is located in the orbit. To leave the orbit, those nerves have to travel through the optic canal uh, before they form the optic chiasm within the cranium. So no synapses have taken place from the ganglion cells. This is still the central process of the ganglion cell, which now crosses the optic chiasm uh, forms the optic tract before synapsing on the lateral geniculate nucleus. So you can imagine if there is uh, maybe a tumor that's taking up the entire optic canal, pinching off the optic nerve, then that would result in blindness from that one eye. Uh, there's another lecture coming up that covers a lot of the visual system uh, in much more detail. So we'll get to those different iterations of how to uh, diagnose visual conditions uh, related to the optic nerve and the optic tract. So this brings up kind of another point that a lot of the information I'm presenting to you in this set of slides you're not going to fully understand. This is intended to be an overview of the cranial nerves and we're going to build on this information for the rest of the semester. So uh, take heart that this information is, is uh, we're going to reinforce it and revisit all of this again and again uh, as the semester progresses. And then another SSA nerve is going to be uh, cranial nerve 8, the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is responsible for both the auditory sense and the vestibular balance sense. So cranial nerve 8 has two different uh, portions to it, a vestibular portion and a cochlear portion. So the vestibular ganglion, uh, located here in red, has its uh, uh, different processes. It has a peripheral process that heads to the utricle and the canals, the saccules of the, uh, of the vestibular apparatuses. It also has a central process that travels uh, into the central nervous system to synapse on one of the vestibular nuclei. Now we also have the spiral ganglion, part of the cochlear apparatus that provides our sense of hearing. It has a peripheral process that heads to the, uh, the uh, organ of corti, which is responsible for detecting the movements of sound waves within the cochlea. <clears throat> Now, the, it has a central process that forms the cochlear nerve, just like the central process forming the vestibular nerve of the vestibular portion. Those converge as the vestibular cochlear nerve after traveling through the internal auditory meatus. And that central process then synapses on the cochlear nuclei in the brainstem. So that's your uh, purely sensory cranial nerves. Now let's talk about the purely motor cranial nerves. We have four of those, cranial nerve 4, 6, uh, uh, 11, and 12. So all of these purely motor cranial nerves have GSE components. So they are going to a skeletal muscle that was formed from uh, the, uh, the uh, somites. <clears throat> so Four and uh, six are the trochlear and abducens nerve. They're part of uh, the extraocular muscles that help you uh, move your eyeball and, and orient on, a, uh, on uh, something in your visual field. Then we have the uh, spinal accessory nerve, which we've heard about before. It innervates trap and sternocleidomastoid. We also have hypoglossal nerve that's responsible for innervating the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the tongue. So none of these structures are particularly uh, derived from visceral or um, pharyngeal components. So they are considered GSEs. So let's look at the trochlear nerve in relation to 
the uh, extraocular muscles uh, in the orbit. So this nerve, uh, it, it has a nucleus where the uh, analogous lower motor neuron is going to be located, and that nucleus is the trochlear nucleus. Now we have a, uh, the trochlear nerve uh, branching out from that nucleus, traveling out from that nucleus as it uh, proceeds to uh, innervate the trochlear uh, uh, muscle, the superior orbital oblique muscle. It is called the, um, the uh, trochlear nerve because the superior orbital oblique muscle travels through a hook, a trochlea. Uh, so this hook uh, changes the directionality of, the of that muscle, which is why it's the muscle is called the superior orbital oblique muscle. Something interesting about the trochlear nerve is that it's the only cranial nerve that uh, exits the brainstem posteriorly. So we'll see that this cranial nerve uh, travels posteriorly to exit the back of the brainstem before wrapping around the brainstem externally uh, to travel through the superior orbital fissure uh, to reach the nerve that it innervates. And you can see here in this uh, cranium, the superior orbital fissure is identified uh, with the arrowhead. <clears throat> Abducens nerve, uh, also one of the nerves that innervates the extraocular muscles. Abducens nerve, similarly, so we're talking about motor nerves here. So abducens nerve has an abducens nucleus. Uh, it has a, a process that travels through the superior orbital fissure and innervates the extraocular muscle responsible for abduction of the eye. That means turning the gaze of the eye away from the midline. So abducens nerve innervates the lateral rectus muscle. It pulls the eye laterally to aim the gaze laterally. <clears throat> now the uh, accessory nerve. Uh, so spinal accessory nerve is the portion of this cranial nerve uh, that originates in the spinal cord. This is the only cranial nerve that has a component that originates outside the brainstem. So we can see that uh, the accessory nucleus, which we've already talked about in the cervical portion, has its own unique roots that exit the spinal cord through the C1 through C5 region. And this cranial nerve uh, travels up through the, um, the vertebral canal to enter the cranium through foramen magnum. It immediately takes a turn and re-exits the cranium through the jugular foramen. Uh, after doing so, we've already talked about its path in the, in the neck as it travels posteriorly to innervate the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid muscles. <clears throat> Now let's talk about cranial nerve 12, hypoglossal. Hypoglossal named because it travels below the tongue. So uh, again, we have a named nucleus which contains the lower motor neuron uh, for hypoglossal nerve called hypoglossal nucleus. Uh, these fibers uh, exit the brain stem anteriorly, travel through the hypoglossal canal. It has its own special canal uh, named for these uh, fibers and then it uh, travels through the neck, loops underneath the tongue, and innervates all of the uh, intrinsic and extrinsic musculature of the tongue, including hyoglossus, uh, styloglossus, and genioglossus. So that's the pure motor. Now let's talk about the really fun ones, the mixed ones. So these mixed cranial nerves have uh, multiple different afferent and efferent components, including visceral uh, structures. Uh, so uh, I include cranial nerve 3, oculomotor nerve, as a mixed cranial nerve because it has uh, visceral efferents. It has parasympathetic fibers in it. Some textbooks uh, classify oculomotor nerve as a uh, purely motor because it only has efferents in it. 
but I consider the parasympathetics to be part of that mixed category. So the first of these that I'm going to talk about is cranial nerve 3, oculomotor. So it's innervating all of the extrinsic uh, muscles of, in the orbit, the extrinsic muscles of the eye that direct the gaze. But it also has parasympathetics that function on the, um, uh, the accommodation of the eye, or the focusing of the eye, uh, things like that. Next we have trigeminal, cranial nerve 5. Trigeminal nerve is responsible for most of the sensation to the face, so it's a large GSA uh, component to it. But it also has SVEs because it is innervating the muscles of mastication and a few others uh, listed here, mylohyoid, anterior belly of the digastric, and the two tiny tensors, tensor tympani and tensor veli palatini. Uh, so we'll talk about those in, in detail as we get to the lecture on the uh, pterygopalatine fossa and, and all of that. Next we have uh, cranial nerve 7, and this is where it starts to get complicated, facial nerve. Uh, so facial nerve has SVE components that do all the muscles of facial expression. So every time you move uh, a muscle on the surface of your face, that's a muscle of facial expression. Uh, and so um, the facial nerve is responsible for that. Also has parasympathetics to a lot of the salivary glands in the face. We'll talk about those in detail. Uh, GSA, so it has a small GSA component to it. The GSAs of facial nerve are responsible mainly for sensation of the auricle of the ear. Some of the external auditory canal as well. Um, as well as the uh, external portion of the tympanic membrane. But the, um, other than the SVEs, the main thing we think about with facial nerve are the SVAs. So uh, facial nerve is responsible for most of the taste fibers on your tongue. The anterior two-thirds of your tongue are innervated uh, by facial nerve. These gustatory taste buds are innervated by facial nerve. There are also some pal some um, soft palate um, uh, um, uh, taste buds, and so facial nerve uh, innervates those too. So you can actually taste things on the roof of your mouth. Who knew? Now moving on, cranial nerve 9. So there are five total mixed cranial nerves. Cranial nerve 9 is the glossopharyngeal. Uh, so again, this one gets complicated. Uh, you can read here. One of the interesting things about cranial nerve 9 is that so it's responsible for the pharyngeal constrictors when you swallow glossopharyngeal nerve is doing that uh, it has a big parasympathetic component also has some general visceral afferent components uh, to the carotid body and carotid sinus in your neck that detect your blood pressure and the ph the carbon dioxide concentrations in your blood uh, to help regulate your respiratory rate um, Cranial nerve 9 also does the posterior one-third of your tongue, the taste fibers there. It has some sensory components to the uh, palate, tongue, um, uh, the pharyngeal uh, portion of your neck. Uh, but moving on uh, to vagus nerve. Uh, this is vagus nerve, when you think about parasympathetics in the head and neck, vagus nerve is probably going to be the first one that comes to mind because it's parasympathetics. Uh, travel down into the abdomen and thorax and perform all the parasympathetics down to the splenic flexure of your colon. Uh, so, large parasympathetic component to vagus nerve. Vagus nerve is also uh, going to uh, function on the laryngeal muscles, the muscles of your voice box. So when you're talking, move it, changing the pitch in your voice, uh, then the vagus nerve is the one that's doing that, changing all of those intrinsic muscles of your uh, voice box. <clears throat> uh, also, let's see, um, so uh, that's it. Uh, you know, it's got all these other components we'll talk about in detail, but that's the overview of these mixed cranial nerves. So now let's see what these uh, nerves have in store for us. Oculomotor nerve, it has a GSE component. So think of that in terms of a lower motor neuron. Where is the lower motor uh, neuron nucleus? And that nucleus is the oculomotor nucleus. Uh, 
It has uh, uh, fibers axons that project out peripherally, traveling through the superior orbital fissure to synapse on the different extraocular muscles, such as superior rectus, medial rectus, the ones that we didn't talk about with trochlear and abducens. <clears throat> so that is the GSE component of oculomotor. The uh, GVE component comes from the accessory oculomotor nucleus, which is uh, very close to oculomotor nucleus. It has a preganglionic fiber that travels out to the ciliary ganglion, traveling with oculomotor nerve the whole time until uh, it branches from the inferior division of oculomotor nerve to synapse on the ciliary ganglion. Ciliary ganglion is the location of the second order neuron in this chain. So that second order neuron has postganglionic fibers that travel into the intrinsic uh, parasympathetic smooth muscles of the eye uh, to innervate uh, those smooth muscles, such as uh, the ciliaris muscle uh, and the uh, dilator uh, pupillae, or the uh, sphincter pupillae too, perhaps. So uh, here again, picture of the superior orbital fissure. Uh, so the uh, accessory ocular motor nucleus is going to be innervating just the uh, sphincter pupillae and the ciliaris uh, muscle for uh, accommodation and uh, focusing and, and uh, constriction of the eye during parasympathetic uh, response. Okay, moving on to the trigeminal ganglion and the trigeminal nerve cranial nerve 5. This is primarily a sensory nerve, so it has a large ganglion. Uh, so trigeminal nerve does all of the sensation to the entire face, uh, back to, uh, you know, about where the ears are. Uh, so trigeminal ganglion is quite large, located on the petrous ridge of the temporal bone inside the cranium. So that trigeminal ganglion is the location of the cell body's origin for the sensory components. It has a central process that heads uh, centrally into the brainstem to synapse on the uh, sensory nuclei of the trigeminal system. It has uh, multiple different peripheral processes that head through different foramen to uh, innervate, arborize on different portions of the face. So first we have the three different divisions of cranial nerve. The first is V1, or the ophthalmic nerve. The next, so the ophthalmic nerve is traveling through the superior orbital fissure to uh, provide sensation to the forehead above the eyes. The uh, maxillary nerve, V2, traveling through the foramen rotundum uh, to the region of the cheeks. Finally, we have the mandibular division uh, traveling through foramen ovale down to the region of the mandible, the jaw. So that's why trigeminal nerve is called trigeminal because it has three uh, components, three um, matching components. <clears throat> you may also uh, hear trigeminal ganglion called the semilunar ganglion because of its shape. It's kind of a half moon shape uh, when we dissect it we'll see now trigeminal nerve also has motor components those motor components travel through uh, trigeminal nerve and travel through the trigeminal ganglion but they do so without synapsing because they are motor nerves not sensory not autonomics they simply take that same route from the trigeminal ganglion, they travel down with the mandibular division. So these are all branches of the trigeminal motor nucleus uh, somewhere in the brainstem uh, that has fibers that travel out peripherally through the mandibular V3 division. Uh, and in so doing, they end up synapsing, innervating the muscles of mastication <clears throat> and a few others we've already mentioned. So here are the dermatome patterns 
of these different portions of trigeminal nerve and the rest of the face. Uh, so you can take a look at that. Uh, already mentioned uh, those. The ophthalmic division we'll talk about in more detail. So each of these divisions is going to branch prolifically. And so we need to know the names of these branches and where they go because each branch is going to take a different route. And those differences allow us to diagnose issues in these patients. So again, we have ophthalmic nerve traveling through the superior orbital fissure. It will give off a frontal nerve inside the orbit where the eye is located. And that frontal nerve will branch into a supraorbital and a supratrochlear nerve. Supratrochlear is more medial because that trochlea we talked about already is more medial. Supraorbital is traveling out above the orbit into the forehead. So you've got two branches of frontal nerve traveling out to the forehead. We also have a lacrimal nerve heading out laterally in the orbit toward the lacrimal gland and the lateral side of the orbit. And we have a nasociliary nerve as well in the orbit. <clears throat> so now talking about the maxillary division. Maxillary division travels through foramen rotundum. So foramen rotundum stands upright as if you were walking through one of those columned entryways into this big round chamber. You know, you see these uh, colonial style, um, uh, you know, houses or structures with the big columns and you walk through that. That's foramen rotundum. You're walking into that, into this big round chamber, which is the orbit. The orbit is that region in the cranium where the eye uh, resides. <clears throat> so foramen rotundum contains the maxillary nerve, V2, and that maxillary nerve branches into a number of different peripheral processes. An infraorbital coming out through the infraorbital foramen below the eye. That's where uh, Mr. Spock does his Vulcan mind meld techniques in the infraorbital foramen. There's a mental foramen down here where he uh, collects information from as well. You know, it's, it's all true, isn't it? Uh, then we have the greater and lesser palatine nerves supplying the palate inside your mouth. Zygomatic nerve traveling out by the zygomatic arch. And we have the uh, alveolar nerves. We have a posterior superior alveolar nerve that uh, provides sensation to the posterior teeth. And a, uh, uh, additionally, we have the nasopalatine uh, nerve traveling internally uh, to the nasal septum. <clears throat> now the mandibular division. It contains those GSA and SVE fibers. The, uh, both of these fibers travel through foramen ovale, which is a hole in the petrous ridge of the temporal bone. Foramen ovale, an oval, uh, kind of like an opening into the sewer, like a sewer cap. Uh, so foramen uh, ovale, mandibular nerve travels through it and then will branch it'll branch into a lingual nerve that supplies the tongue. It'll branch into an al inferior alveolar nerve that supplies the uh, teeth of the mandible. It will branch into a buccal nerve that supplies sensation to the cheeks, as well as an auriculotemporal nerve uh, heading back to um, supply the region around the ear. Now it's important uh, as we get more involved studying these branches to note that there are some redundant names here that we're going to learn about. So, for instance, buccal nerve, uh, the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, also has a buccal nerve in it. I uh, believe it also has a zygomatic nerve. So, when we're talking about these nerves, we have to be sure that we identify is this um, buccal nerve of facial or of, uh, or of the mandibular division of trigeminal. And so these nerves run in uh, different places at different depths. And so during the dissection, we'll see that. Uh, but it's important to keep those distinct in your mind, even though they have similar names. So now talking about the SVE components, the muscles that they innervate, they're going to be innervating the uh, muscles of mastication, temporalis muscle, masseter, uh, 
the pterygoids, medial and lateral, inside the infratemporal fossa. So you can see those pterygoids here deep to the mandible. Uh, it will also be innervating some muscles we don't see here uh, that we'll talk about in detail as we uh, proceed through the lectures on the head and neck. The mylohyoid, the anterior belly of the digastric here below uh, the jawline, as well as tensor tympani and tensor veli palatini deep inside the head. Uh, we'll have to bisect the head to see uh, the tensor veli palatini. Tensor tympani is actually an interesting tiny little muscle uh, that um, pulls uh, the, bones, the, the uh, bones away from the tympanic membrane. It's important that it's innervated by trigeminal motor nucleus because when you're chewing, uh, the sounds of your chewing are so close to your tympanic membrane uh, that it would um, cause pain uh, to hear that. So tensor tympani is, is contracted uh, to dull the sounds of chewing as you're chewing. So that's why it's innervated by the same nerve as the nerve that innervates the muscles of mastication. <clears throat> Uh, so, let's move on and look at uh, facial nerve, cranial nerve 7. This has a lot of different components, and we'll take them one at a time. So, cranial nerve 7 originates uh, below the pons, exits anteriorly as a facial nerve, and enters the cranium through the internal auditory meatus. The internal auditory meatus has a facial canal which has two portions to it. It has a horizontal portion and a vertical portion. At the inflection of those two portions of the facial canal is a ganglion called the geniculate ganglion. Geniculate ganglion is the sensory ganglion for the GSA fibers of facial uh, nerve. There are two exits uh, to the facial canal. One is the stylomastoid foramen. <clears throat> the other, uh, the, uh, the uh, greater petrosal nerve travels out anteriorly. So we'll talk about these uh, in detail. So the inferior opening is what we'll talk about first, I believe. And so the stylomastoid foramen is the external inferior opening through which the SVE fibers travel. Those SVE fibers go and, and synapse on and innervate the muscles of mastication. I'm sorry, the muscles of facial expression uh, in the face. All of these superficial muscles that make your face move, those are muscles of facial expression. And we'll enumerate those in detail when we talk about those in a later lecture. So what's next? So the uh, <clears throat> greater... Uh, petrosal nerve have, contains GVE fibers. Those GVE fibers have passed through the geniculate ganglion, and here they, they did not synapse on the geniculate ganglion. The geniculate ganglion is only the GSA components of facial nerve. So these are GVE components. They travel through geniculate ganglion to synapse on the pterygopalatine ganglion. Uh, <clears throat> So the, um, the central nucleus of these GVE fibers is the superior salivary nucleus, sometimes uh, called the superior salivatory nucleus. Uh, but uh, this uh, pterygopalatine ganglion where, on which they synapse then sends postganglionic fibers to the different mucosal glands, the different um, uh, salivary glands, secretory glands in the face, like the lacrimal gland in the eye, uh, or the uh, nasal and oral mucosa. Uh, corda tympani has GVE components. So corda tympani, let's see, does it highlight it? Yes, so corda tympani uh, here has uh, GVE components uh, that are traveling out through, uh, another slide has it in detail, but traveling through the uh, um, the petrotympanic fissure, anterior to the stylomastoid foramen. Uh, so these GVE components are traveling from 
the uh, superior salivary nucleus down to uh, the submandibular ganglion. Uh, <clears throat> the submandibular ganglion will then synapse on the submandibular glands and the sublingual glands to secrete saliva into the mouth. Uh, so that is an important component of, of um, the whole mastication process. Uh, chemically weakening the food through the proteases uh, in the saliva. <clears throat> Corda tympani also has SVA components. These SVA components are the tape from the taste buds of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So they receive that taste information, uh, and that taste information travels through the corda tympani, the cell body, uh, is in the geniculate ganglion. So these are sensory afferent fibers. So we're talking about the cell body located in the geniculate ganglion and it has a peripheral process, which is corda tympani, and a central process, which is facial nerve. So those SVA components then travel centrally uh, to synapse on the taste nucleus in the brainstem. And that taste nucleus is called nucleus solitarius or nucleus tractus solitarius, sometimes just called NTS. <clears throat> so now uh, we're talking about those um, SVE components. So this is number three on this slide. SVE components traveling out through stylomastoid foramen, already talked about it, heading to the muscles of facial expression. Uh, there are also, also a small GSA component traveling out of the stylomastoid foramen, heading to the ear, uh, heading out of um, that region, so the external portion of the ear uh, at the stylomastoid foramen. So that's where those GSA components are located. And those GSA components, their cell body is also located in the, uh, the geniculate ganglion. Okay, next slide. So there, they're all highlighted on the slide in their respective colors. And now, so let's take a look at the cranium. So here we have performed a uh, craniotomy. We've removed the calvarium, taking it off the top of the head. We're looking down at a three quarters posterior view of the cranium. We can see foramen magnum here. This is the zygomatic arch. This is the uh, petrous ridge. So that's actually uh, foramen ovale there through which V3 travels. So here we can see the internal auditory meatus uh, on the inferior portion, the vertical portion of the petrous ridge of the temporal bone. So that is the foramen through which uh, uh, facial nerve travels to enter the facial canal, the horizontal portion of the facial canal before branching out to the rest of its structure. So here we've outlined and isolated the temporal bone so you can see uh, that, that um, relationship in an isolated view. And then here we're looking at the lateral side of the cranium with mandible. Here we've uh, removed uh, that portion of the temporal bone. Uh, so we see it isolated, we've removed the mandible uh, so you can see the location of the stylomastoid foramen next to the external auditory meatus. And we can see the petrotympanic fissure where corda tympani uh, travels. Uh, it, it, those relationships to the uh, external auditory meatus. So again, showing that isolation of that structure. So here we have taken a cross-section through that temporal bone, through the external auditory meatus, and we are seeing here the geniculate ganglion at the inflection point of the facial canal. So uh, we can see the different nerve components uh, branching from the geniculate ganglion, that inflection point in facial canal. We can see a greater petrosal nerve traveling anteriorly through the petrosal canal. We can see 
A facial nerve traveling inferiorly to exit out stylomastoid foramen. So this is the vertical portion of the, uh, of the facial canal. And here we see corda tympani as it travels down uh, slightly through the vertical portion. And then it exits out through its own uh, little tiny canaliculus uh, to travel where it needs to. And we'll talk about all these in greater detail. Again, this is just forming the overview on which we are going to build throughout the rest of this semester. So the SVE components after they exit stylomastoid foramen branch into a number of different uh, structures that innervate the different uh, uh, portions of the different uh, muscles of facial expression. So I'm not going to ask you to associate one muscle of facial expression with one nerve. Just understand and be able to identify that these different nerves are in these different locations and are going to impact different regions of facial muscles. So these nerves are named after the region of the face uh, that they overlie. So uh, for instance, temporal nerve is traveling up over the temporal uh, portion of the face. Zygomatic nerve is going to branch over the zygomatic arch. Uh, here we have buccal nerve uh, traveling over in the superficial portion of the cheek, traveling right here toward the angle of the orus. Uh, we have the uh, marginomandibular branch, uh, sometimes just called the mandibular branch, but marginomandibular I believe is more accurate. I use that because it's traveling along the margin of the mandible uh, to innervate the um, lower uh, inferior muscles, inferior to the mouth. Uh, now we have the cervical branch traveling down over the neck, uh, to supply, for instance, like platysma, uh, etc. <clears throat> so that is uh, cranial nerve 7. And that's not even the most complicated one. So now let's move into uh, glossopharyngeal nerve. You know, pause at any time, take a break, step away, uh, come back, and uh, get back into it. So uh, glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 9, has a multitude of different components. It's got sensory, somatomotor, uh, as well as visceromotor, parasympathetics. We're gonna talk about all of these in more detail. <clears throat> so um, cranial nerve nine, glossopharyngeal, uh, is joined by uh, vagus and, uh, and um, the cranial nerve 11, spinal accessory. And all three of those cranial nerves exit the cranium by traveling through jugular foramen, which you can see here below the temporal bone uh, in the interior view of the cranium. So we see uh, internal auditory meatus just above and jugular foramen just below. So when you think cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, you're thinking jugular foramen. So, uh, now let's talk about the location of the cell bodies of this nucleus, the efferent cell bodies in particular. So, the somatomotor, the, um, the SVE fibers of uh, cranial nerve 9 originate in nucleus ambiguous. It's called nucleus ambiguous because when you look at a cross-section of the brain stem, this nucleus doesn't stand out very much. Its borders, its boundary is ambiguous. So, uh, as, you know, being as creative as we are as anatomists, we named it nucleus ambiguous. So this is where the lower motor neurons are. So glossopharyngeal nerve, nucleus ambiguous fibers are innervating the stylopharyngeus muscle. These fibers uh, exit through the uh, jugular foramen uh, travel out into the neck and synapse on stylopharyngeus muscle. So that's it. That's easy. Super easy. <clears throat> now, uh, glossopharyngeal has a large GVE component to it. These GVE fibers originate in the inferior salivary nucleus. So we had facial nerve, 
that had the superior salivary nucleus. Now we've got glossopharyngeal that has the inferior salivary nucleus. So those, uh, those GVE fibers, uh, these are parasympathetics. They end up uh, synapsing. They travel through jugular foramen, take a kind of circuitous route we'll talk about in detail later, end up synapsing on the otic ganglion. So that's the preganglionic fiber of inferior salivary nucleus. So now there is a cell body of a postganglionic fiber in the otic ganglion. That postganglionic fiber travels out uh, uh, and it, it ends up synapsing on the parotid gland. The parotid gland in your cheek region uh, is the main gland that's going to send saliva through the parotid duct through your cheek into your mouth. So main uh, salivary gland for uh, you know, processing food and, and the mastication process. <clears throat> so now let's talk about the afferent fibers of glossopharyngeal <clears throat> nerve. Glossopharyngeal nerve has two ganglia associated with it. These ganglia are located proximal to jugular foramen and they are in line with the rest of the nerve. In fact, most of the time, these ganglia are, are pretty much merged together. You can't differentiate like two very well-defined ganglia. They're just this region on glossopharyngeal nerve. Uh, now, to make life easy, what we say is that the superior ganglion is the main ganglion for the GSA components. And the inferior ganglion is the main ganglion for the SVA and GVA components of glossopharyngeal. This isn't strictly true. Uh, because they're fairly well merged, you know, you're going to have GSA uh, neurons in the inferior. You're going to have SVA in the superior. Uh, and all of these fibers end up traveling in the same space through the same foramen to the same nerve through all the same structures. So um, it's very hard to differentiate these structures in an actual uh, specimen. But this is generally true. <clears throat> so the GSA uh, neurons in the superior ganglion, they are mainly doing sensory to the, um, to the posterior uh, portion of the tongue. This is somatosensory. Uh, it's also doing uh, sensory in the auditory tube, uh, the pharyngeal, uh, the eustachian tube, you know, colloquially called the eustachian tube, but its anatomical name is the auditory tube into the middle ear cavity. So when a, you know, when an individual has an ear infection like a child and they're sensing that pain inside their ear, that's these GSA fibers of glossopharyngeal sending uh, that sensory information through the superior ganglion of glossopharyngeal nerve. <clears throat> now, the inferior ganglion is doing the taste, the taste buds from the posterior one-third of the tongue. So those are the SVAs. Uh, we also have the GVAs of this, uh, of this nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve in the inferior, and those GVAs do the carotid body and carotid sinus at the bifurcation of the co common carotid artery. Uh, so you can see here, those are doing the chemoreception and baroreception. So the central process, so right now we've just talked about the peripheral process and the ganglion. Now the central process of these ganglia travel, th you know, briefly through glossopharyngeal nerve and end up synapsing on one of two ganglia. If they are uh, SVA or GVA, they travel to the nucleus tractus solitarius. We already talked about that with facial nerve. It is the target for the SVAs of taste for facial. It's also the target of the SVAs for the taste of glossopharyngeal. Now the GSAs from the superior ganglion, they travel uh, centrally, the central projections uh, travel along glossopharyngeal nerve, enter the spinal cord, and end up synapsing uh, 
on the sensory trigeminal nucleus. Just like the GSAs of trigeminal nerve. So, you're going to start noticing a pattern here. GSAs of the face. They may have different ganglia, but they're all going to synapse on trigeminal sensory nuclei. The SVAs, they may have different ganglia, but they're going to synapse on the NTS, where taste fibers uh, uh, target. So you're gonna see this pattern throughout. Uh, so this is going to help you start organizing these cranial nerves. So how many times do I have to click next to get through to the next slide? And there we go. So that is uh, glossopharyngeal nerve. So now vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. It has all of these different components again, uh, fairly complicated. So let's break it down. <clears throat> so, uh, we have uh, we have SVE fibers that are part of a vagus nerve. These SVE fibers innervate uh, portions of the pharyngeal constrictors and the larynx, the voice box. <clears throat> these pharyngeal constrictors, these SVE uh, fibers, originate in nucleus ambiguous. If you'll remember, glossopharyngeal also has SVE fibers that innervate pharyngeal muscles. Uh, so nucleus ambiguous is the source, is the lower motor neuron, uh, quote unquote, for all of these pharyngeal muscles. <clears throat> now, we have, uh, we have the uh, GVE fibers, the parasympathetic fibers of vagus nerve. And these efferent fibers are coming from a nucleus called the dorsal motor nucleus of vagus nerve. So you can see those highlighted here uh, <clears throat> on this slide. So an, a quick note about the pharyngeal constrictors is that some textbooks say that glossopharyngeal nerve also innervates the pharyngeal constrictors along with the vagus. Some texts say that only vagus does. Um, so vagus and glossopharyngeal SVEs form a plexus in the neck, and that plexus synapses on and, and innervates these pharyngeal constrictors. So it's very hard to differentiate those uh, and their source. So in this course, I'm telling you that glossopharyngeal uh, innervates stylopharyngeous muscle, and that's it. And then I'm telling you that vagus nerve does the pharynx and larynx. And so I'm making it easy for you in that regard because I know you like to classify things and categorize things strictly. But understand in a clinical setting that you can have differences in this innervation pattern. Uh, and so different pharyngeal muscles can be impacted to different degrees. And so we'll, we'll try to talk about that a little bit, but just be aware of that as you're looking at your textbooks. <clears throat> so now let's talk about the afferents of vagus nerve. So first, so just like glossopharyngeal, vagus nerve has a superior and an inferior ganglion. And just like glossopharyngeal, we categorize these. The superior is mostly GSA, and the inferior is mostly the visceral afferents, SVAs and GVAs. The, the GSAs from the superior ganglion, they innervate the external auditory meatus, uh, just inside the, uh, the ear, the auricle. Not the auricle itself, that's facial nerve, but inside the external auditory meatus, that's vagus nerve. So that innervation pattern is important to understand because that can be a clue as to what nerves are impaired and what foramen are involved. Uh, so don't discount that information. Uh, so the uh, peripheral process does that. The central process travels through jugular foramen and its GSA fibers synapse on sensory trigeminal nuclei. So again, we find GSA fibers uh, synapsing on sensory trigeminal nuclei in the brainstem. Now, the inferior ganglion of vagus nerve 
Uh, that contains the SVAs and GVAs generally. And so uh, those are responsible for um, uh, mucosal innervation around the larynx, as well as uh, sensation from the uh, thoracic and, um, and abdominal visceral organs. <clears throat> and so uh, those SVA and uh, GVA central processes synapse on the nucleus tractus solitarius, as you would expect based on their modality. So if you can categorize these based on their modality, then you've got a good idea about the nucleus that they're going to innervate as long as you're studying it that way, as long as you're organizing the information uh, in that manner. <clears throat> so I have put together a slide, uh, you know, if you, want to, if you want to have it organized this way, showing you the modality and what cranial nerves have it, and also breaking down the cranial nerves, the 12 cranial nerves, and what modalities are in those nerves. So, you know, study, I would say, study based on uh, breaking up the cranial nerves like I have here into what their functions are. And then use slides like this to quiz yourself to make sure you've got the information down as you're reciting it and rehearsing it and drawing it and uh, all of that kind of uh, stuff. So the next slide I'm showing you, this is a, a cross-section of the embryo uh, of the um, brainstem. So here is a coronal view of the brainstem showing you the different nuclei. So just like the spinal cord nuclei were somatotopically organized and organized in a uh, anterior posterior axis, the cranial nerve nuclei are also organized in that way. So here we have taken the brain stem and we've cut it down the middle and then we've splayed it open so it's flat. And on the medial portion, which is most posterior, most dorsal, we see we have efferent nuclei. And these are numbered on your slide, so this is oculomotor. This is the accessory oculomotor, a trochlear, so on and so forth down the line. Then we start getting the GVEs and the SVEs. Then we start getting afferents, uh, the SVAs, the GVAs. Uh, the GSAs, and so all of the GSAs here in the trigeminal sensory nuclei. So a quick note on the trigeminal sensory nuclei. The tri there are three complexes that make up the sensory trigeminal nuclei. There is a mesencephalic, a principal sensory, and a, uh, a, a, a spinal uh, 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 trigeminal nucleus. <clears throat> and so each one of those have different components. So the spinal trigeminal nucleus has, uh, is responsible for uh, crude touch and pain and temperature. The principal trigeminal sensory nucleus is responsible for two-point discrimination and fine touch, as well as conscious proprioception of the jaw and mandible. And the mesencephalic is responsible for non-conscious, reflexive, proprioceptive information. So this is where all of the Golgi tendon reflex and muscle spindle uh, reflexes occur for the jaw. So understand that those exist. Uh, and in this course, I don't distinguish them any further than that. But that's important information that you get. So that is the end of this uh, whirlwind lecture overview of the cranial nerves. From this point, again, we're going to build on this information. So there's a lot you don't understand right now. There's a lot you don't have that's not clicking and making complete sense. And that's because the rest of the lectures are going to follow those pathways and those branches in detail and show you what they innervate, where they branch through. So this is just to get you started, get you that baseline level of information. So thanks for sticking with me, uh, and I uh, hope you enjoy. <laughs>